Hello. Thank you so much for joining us for the virtual MCD speaker series, Living with Sense. My name is Charlotte Jones. I'm the Education Director here at the Museum of Craft and Design. And on behalf of our staff, director, and board, welcome. I am also joined by MCD Education Coordinator Marie Dineinger, who will be providing related chats or links in the chat, as well as MCD Curator Ariel Zaccio, who will be keeping track of and answering any questions that come up. So thank you both for being here. Um, we're very excited to have today's panel present with us, and not only because we have managed to coordinate very busy schedules across four international time zones, but because this group of speakers have joined us today are a fascinating selection of contributors to MCD's current exhibition, Living with Sense. Guest curated by Clara Muller and Elisabetta Pissu, the exhibition, the focus of Living with Sense is on objects, not just scented products, but creative and artful interfaces to deliver sense with manifold design outcomes from the hedonic to the functional. I encourage everyone to visit the exhibition, whether in person using the free admission code that we're about to drop in the chat or via the interactive 360 view virtual exhibition link, which will also be provided in the chat. In this gallery, you will experience an unprecedented collection of useful, meaningful and beautiful olfactory objects to be discovered through both the eyes and the nose. And for local visitors, I have to mention that MCD's popular monthly after, monthly after hours party is back in action. So this Thursday evening, Make returns to the galleries where we will turn the music up, we will get the drinks flowing, and we'll dive into an array of hands-on and nose-on activities that explore living with scents. From DIY designer linen sprays to handcrafted incense cones and a sponsored fragrance bar, we will be bringing the exhibition to life and finally getting back together for some social creativity. Make is free with regular admission and we very much hope to see you there. It is now my pleasure to introduce Clara Muller, French art historian, critic, and curator. Clara holds graduate degrees in literature, art history, and museum studies from La Sorbonne, New York University, and Columbia. She is pursuing research on the politics of breathing in contemporary art and writes extensively about the diversity of art practices using scent as a medium. She has contributed to several exhibition catalogs, artists' monographs, and academic publications on the subject of olfactory art, both in French and in English. She has been a writer for the olfactory magazine Nez since 2016, for which she explores the intersections of perfumery and olfaction with literature, cinema, design, architecture, and the visual arts. She has also collaborated with several art publications and given many talks worldwide about the various ways in which art and olfaction can meet. As a curator, she collaborated with the Grand Musée de Parfum in Paris in 2016 and worked on the Nez à Nez Contemporary Perfumers Exhibition at the Museum of Design and Contemporary Applied Arts in Lausanne in 2019. In 2022, she co-curated Living with Sense here at the Museum of Craft and Design in San Francisco, along with Italian curator, Elisabetta Pissu. It has been a pleasure to work with you, Clara. Thank you so much for being here and for all of your wonderful ideas for audience engagement. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Um, and hello to everyone joining us from across the world from this online event. We're really excited to be able to be together, even virtually even virtually to have this discussion despite our very scattered uh, geographical locations. Um, so as you said, you uh, introduced me pretty thoroughly, but so my name is Clara Muller. Uh, I'm a French art historian specializing in the study of uh, olfactory art practices and a contributor uh, for the olfactory magazine Ne. And I have curated uh, Living with Sense currently on view at the museum alongside uh, Elisabeth Apissou. And before introducing our three speakers, I just wanted to say a few words about this exhibition because it's um, basically the first of its kind. And we wanted this exhibition to be, if not exhaustive, at least quite comprehensive uh, in terms of exposing the various ways in which contemporary design and sense uh, can come together today. So the exhibition is divided uh, in five sections and uh, offering a, ver a variety of angles um, by gathering objects and projects which um, together shed light on some specific aspects of the subject. 
there are many fascinating applications um, for sense and many ways of mediating their relation uh, to the bodies and uh, to our bodies and our minds. Um, so Elizabeth and I elaborated the sections based on shared concerns and purposes, inspirations and ambitions, because all the designers in the show are concerned with new ways of delivering sense but they all aspire to different design outcomes. And as you said, these outcomes range from the purely hedonic or aesthetic to the most useful and functional. And one of the most interesting things we noticed uh, when we were uh, working on the exhibition is how these designers, uh, how their concerns often converge with very cultural, ancient or sometimes scientific considerations. Um, so for the visitors, the journey through the five sections of the exhibition um, should allow to get a deeper understanding of how we can benefit from smells, how we can use our nose for a wide variety of things, um, and overall how design can help us in many aspects to better live with and using scent. Um, today, with this talk, we will focus on some of the most um, useful applications of sense and olfactory design presented in the exhibition. We'll focus on projects that des are designed to allow sense to interact with the body in beneficial ways by serving as an alternative modality of communication. We'll see that people suffering from certain illnesses um, or disabilities can benefit even more greatly uh, from smells, whether to communicate or just to take care of themselves. So I'm really glad to uh, have here three specialists in their respective fields, artists, designers, and scientists. Um, they're brought together in this panel this discussion to help us understand why and how scents are so essential to our lives and how they can be of help in more than one manner. Uh, I'll introduce them briefly before uh, giving them uh, the floor. First, we'll hear from Peter de Coupere, who's a Belgian visual artist who's been experimenting with smells uh, in art and design for 20 years and who's created the first olfactory alphabet for visually impaired people. Then we'll turn to British curator and scent historian Lindsay Ostrom, who produces events uh, which greatly engage people uh, with fragrance and who, uh, in collaboration with uh, Rod Design, imagine an electronic clock which gently invites people with dementia to eat by stimulating their appetite. And finally, we'll listen to Dr. Daniel Reed, who's Associate Director at the Mono Chemical Senses Center in Philadelphia, and who's been researching the genetics of taste and smell for years, as well as taste and smell loss, especially since the COVID-19 pandemic. <laughs> so, sorry. She can teach us about um, the crucial importance of this chemical sense in our lives and what happens when we lose it. So we'll listen to all of them and then we'll have a small and short discussion on the subjects raised by their works and their presentations. And I think I'm done. So thank you to the three of you for being with us today. And Peter, you're up. Thank you, Clara. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. So uh, first of all, I'm very grateful to be invited to be here today. Um, so I'm Peter de Cupere. I'm an olfactory artist, researcher, and also professor at the Pixel Met School of Arts in Hasselt in Belgium. I'm also a member of the advisory board of Ode Europa. And in 2018, I received the Art and Olfaction Award uh, from the Institute of Art and Olfaction from Los Angeles, where I'm very proud of. Um, I teach the use of the nearby senses in art with a focus on olfactory art and learn my students to work around the context of smell or to add context via the sense of smell uh, by giving workshops in scent composition and learning them how to get an odor out of a material through distillation or other techniques. At the moment, I'm also doing a research on how to use 3D printing in combination with scented materials. So in this lecture, I focus on some of my works that are more related to care with focus 
on how I use the sense of smell to communicate, navigate, and to enjoy. These works started from an artistic creation process and transformed into more functional works than being works of art. I first showed a very short three olfactory installations with a social context and explained then how I came to the alphabet, which is now on show in the exhibition Living with Sense. For this, I start with the olfactiano, the first scent working piano uh, in the world and the blind smell stick. But let us first start with more than 20 years ago. In 1999, hospitals in Belgium and probably in a lot of countries had a typical hospital smell and sometimes still do. Uh, to let children not have to be confronted with the hospital smell as a child, I installed an installation in the entrance hall that smelled just like the sweet smell of Frutella strawberry candies. These sweets were very popular in Belgium at the time and they still are. The result was that the children who entered the hospital for cancer treatment forgot for a moment that they were entering a hospital. They were more curious about where this is lovely scent uh, is coming from. The children were also allowed to take a clown's nose from one of the brown noses. Thus, there was also a link made with the clinic clowns who were, in the, were there for the children. Uh, in 2004, I realized smell of flowers uh, for a care center for the elderly that suffer from uh, dementia in order to help inhabitants finding their way without realizing it. I created three scent emanating floral, uh, floral sculptures that are linked to a different uh, pavilion by color and scent. People can sniff their way following the olfactory and visible trail let out for them. The scents are chosen by aromatherapists. The aromas change during the year, depending on the season or specific collaborations or celebrations. For people suffering from dementia, the sensory stimuli offers often a pleasant environment in daily life. Since their cognitive abilities are severely affected, like childhood memories can often exclusively be evoked by the senses. In 2016, five refugees visited my studio under supervision to discuss how we can work together in an exhibition called Strange Birds. These refugees were mentally broken. Uh, they were not able to talk about what they had experienced in their home countries. I introduced them to 50 smells, some of which caused them an extreme reaction. reaction. When they smelled the odor of death or blood, they began to cry and stories emerged of things they had never dared to talk about before. Family that was killed, going to the gymnasium every day to see if among the victims there were no relatives and to have the smell, the stench of dried blood there every day. And so many more sad stories. When they smelled honey, mint or lavender, they became calmer and told about their family and their home habits. Their stories were so heartbreaking that we decided to exhibit their stories in combination with birdhouses. Uh, yeah, these birdhouses actually because um, there are nose houses, I call them. Uh, there are uh, birdhouses in which the opening uh, is in the shape of a nose. You can stick your nose in it to smell the sands in it. In the project Strange Birds, 10 nose houses were placed on the largest birdhouse mentioned in the Guinness Book of World Records. Smells were applied to the nose houses that referred to a positive and negative memory of the five refugees. Along with their story, this allowed their, their rec recollection to be shared with others. The olfactiano works like a mix of a piano and an organ. The keys of the sand piano are subdivided into three layers, just like the three notes in a perfume, bass, middle, and top notes. The olfactiano has 27 keys, uh, allowing to create more than 4,374 different scent combinations depending on the desired scent intensity. There are 27 specific scents and rather 26 scents and one scent divider that is left open to fill the room with fresh air. The idea of using 26 scents was already based on the idea to create a scent alphabet. So instead of actually uh, reading a book, 
you could simply close your eyes and focus on the fragrances and the way the mix smells. Most concerts took between seven and 15 minutes. To help me prepare this, uh, my scent concerts, I developed a dedicated computer program that allows me to prepare the concerts properly. I just had to, the scent, had to check the scent scores on my laptop. You see here three examples of such a score. Um, the Olfactiano was in this way, in one way, a predecessor of the alphabet. Finding your way by smelling. With the blind smell stick, you redesign your own perception of a given location. By navigating via smells, you experience the city differently. You smell the ground and all the miasmas you encounter along the way. An experienced smeller would be able to find his or her way back to by following the scents. The blind smell stick is an instinctive device. It allows you to refocus on your own instinctive behavior. Depending on the smell you perceive, you will walk a bit farther or take a different route or take a short break to take in the unexpectedly rich olfactory palette. If we give every street a different smell, blind people uh, could determine where they are in the city purely on the basis of the smell. We can also install a trail of scent that they can follow with the blind smell stick. It can be used in exhibitions to draw visitors' attention to smell to smells in our society. The blind smell stick consists of a number of components that ensure that the smells are drawn quickly and without any dust into the hollow part of the stick and are transported via pipe to the user's nose. Another device that goes with the blind smell stick is a blind smell touch. The blind smell touch is a glove that allows you to smell objects, food, plants, and persons at arm's length. And then we come to the alphabet. First of all, I'm very pleased to have the alphabet in the exhibition Living with Sense, curated by Clara Muller and Elisabetta uh, Pisu. The wall exhibition exists out of such great olfactory inventions and designs. So what is the alphabet? The alphabet is like the name indicates an olfactory alphabet, when sense becomes letters. To realize it, I worked together with seven blind and visually impaired people to make the selection of the fragrances. Without them, the alphabet would never have left the drawing board. Every scent ambassador has made a unique contribution to the development of this beautiful sensory project based on their own lived experiences. It was first shown, shown in 2021 in the exhibition, The World Within Reach, curated by Dr. Uh, Piet de Vos, who is blind, and Tonya Indeclave, uh, who is visible impaired. Because of, COVID, uh, sorry, because of COVID safety, I had to install food pumps to activate the 26 cent letters. The exhibition was develop, developed that also blind people could visit, experience, and test the alphabet. So how does it work? Imagine that you can read words and text just by smelling. With every breath, we unconsciously smell. By linking specific sense to letters, we can expand our ability uh, to read and learn. The concept is easy. Every letter is linked to a fragrance, scent molecule, which you can learn. Words are formed from a combination of several others, and from words come sentences. For every letter, there is a scent molecule used. Reading more scents create a word. Words become scent compositions. For the scent, in the letter modules, I used scent polymers. This is already a research by itself. The smell is concentrated to the letter and can be smelled for months, even more than a year, depending on which fragrance is used. And this without the need to add a new fragrance. Luckily, nowadays, there are many possibilities for blind people to obtain information. For example, most mobile phones are equipped to help them with audio advice. But not everyone can handle this. The alphabet is not intended to replace the Bryce script, the blind writing script, uh, learn, uh, reading script. On the contrary, it is 
an addition or a possible, possible alternative. There are also blind people who are deaf and who do not have the ability to read with their fingers. Then the alphabet might be a solution. It is also a wrong idea that all blind people can read Braille. There are many blind people who do not succeed in mastering Braille. Like Tonya here with her dog Victoria. She can read Braille, but after such a long time, she still has difficulties to read fast with it. Or Frankie, who's, who weaves uh, shares for a living. Because of this, his hands are very rough and it is also more difficult for him to read Braille. The blind and the visible impaired people see also advantages in the alphabet. With Braille, you have to feel letter after letter, which is time consuming. With the alphabet, you have the possibility to read words by learning scent compositions. Take the word, the word school. Uh, they have to fill the, uh, the braille letters, S-C-H-O-O-L, before they have read the whole wor uh, word. While, while with the alphabet, they can learn to read the scent composition of all the fragments letters of the word school. So they can learn to read faster. The alphabet allows letters, words, and sentences to be translated into sense, thus creating an alpha language. Imagine what it would be like to be able to translate a digital text into an olfactory one, simply by breathing. The alpha readers makes it possible to read faster. The idea behind it is that with every breath, we take a smell. The alpha readers are conceptualized to activate the next scented letter or smell word by word uh, you breathe in. The faster or the harder you breathe, you breathe, uh, breathe uh, the, word, the more letters or words you will smell. This is a conceptual idea at the moment. Nevertheless, in combination with a remote control, there should be a realistic solution that can be realized in the near future. I keep on working on this. Before I end my lecture, I would like to show two screenshots from the end of the documentary of the making of the alphabet, which tells in a way the, the future will give the answer if it's not possible or, or if it's possible or not. One thing is for sure, it's possible to read by smelling, but a lot of research still needs to be done to make it work in society. As an artist, I must also leave this to more applied researchers it started from an artistic project and provide and proved that it, it's functionally possible, which, uh, which suddenly gave it an applied value. Further research needs to be done, but for that other scientists needs to get involved. I'm thinking of psychologists, linguists, specialists in artificial intelligence, and of course, more sense specialists, but that needs budget. I see even more possibilities with the alphabet to send it to the universe with the NASA, as by my knowing, there's never sent a chemical language to the universe. And maybe if there's alien life, it might be that they communicate on a non-visible and non-auditive way. I should contact Elon Musk. If someone has this phone number, please let me know. However, there are more ways to integrate the alphabet, like send signs in the city to warn people or in war to communicate by smelling secret languages. As we also consciously conscious, conscious, uh, smell it, uh, it maybe have more possibilities like learning while we are sleeping. It are just thoughts, but as an artist, uh, uh, but as an artist thinking out of the box brought me further than staying inside my safe zone. So now I'm working on a smell reader device that you can read while you are sleeping. So, and I love to end with this news that Alphabet got recently the honor to receive the Public International New Technology Award, which is a great honor to receive. In reply to the call for entries, uh, 836 candidates representing 72 nationalities worldwide have applied. Out of this project, an international jury has selected 20 nominees from which an alphabet received finally the public award. So you don't have to believe you don't have to be blind to believe in it. I thank you all. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much. I actually love when artists uh, 
uh, encourage out of the box uh, scholar research and new work with scientists. And just before maybe um, we uh, we listen to Lizzie, I just had one very specific question that I wanted to ask now is you mentioned that you worked with visually impaired and, and blind people to select each smell for each letter. And I was wondering how did this process go and how did you make it so that each uh, sense was very distinct, I guess, from one another so that it, you'd have a good legibility. So how, what mm -hmm. kind of sense and how did you select them? Yeah. Um Actually, when, when I started, you see here, for example, on the on the left, um, um, Mailan, she's, she's uh, she, I made a little device where they could put their selection on the letters. So there are the braille letters that they can read. There are also the braille on the bottle standing. And so they can smell and select in that way which letter they find that, that fits to a specific uh, uh, scent. Um, for some, for example, for uh, Dr. Peter Voss, he, he has his own uh, color alphabet he made by himself because he, until his five years, he could see and he, in his mind, he has a kind, uh, kind of color alphabet in his mind. And if he created uh, the, his selection was made by, by just uh, selecting uh, which uh, smell referred to a color for him related to uh, a number or um, a letter specific. Uh, here on the left, you see uh, um, Tonya with her dog Victoria, and there we see also the kind of selection palettes. So there, are actually, everyone from them uh, got 54 uh, fragrances. I made a play selection because you cannot give it already quite a lot for them to smell because they're not used to it, and I let them decide which kind of fragrance uh, they put to one specific letter. Then I put it all in an Excel file, and I compared. And the letters that, that were uh, smelt the same for several people, I choose as, as a base uh, letter. But I know in reality, um, if, if it comes to a, a really uh, working uh, alphabet, all these uh, fragrances, there has to be done a research about which fragrance to use on which uh, quality intensity. Um, I, I prefer to work with scent molecules because you don't get uh, tired from uh, smelling them. When I make a scent composition with uh, synthetic uh, uh, fragrances, I can work all day without being uh, tired. By, by, um, so, so it's not like uh, you're smelling a perfume because of the perfumes, you would get an overload of uh, fragrances. So it's, it's actually really possible to, to, uh, to smell each scent separately. And that's the amazing part of it, but it's practiced also, it is, it's really uh, exercising. Uh, uh, and that's, I think it has more, um, it would, would work better with children if they can learn it from when they're little, um, because it's learning, it's like we see letter A, it's actually a sign. And with, uh, yeah, smell is also a sign you could see. Right? So, so it's learning the science, new sign, uh, the science you have to learn and uh, which, which is, uh, which you can combine to understand and to the way your language work actually. Okay. Yeah, so it was quite a long selection and uh, process to select each smell. Um, yeah, I, I, did, I did it also during, uh, during COVID. So we worked four months together every week uh, to, to travel to, uh, yeah, to seven, uh, six locations and uh, with them talking with them every week separately. And uh, it was really very interesting. So the people were, I have really gorgeous people. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, maybe we'll come back to it uh, at the end, but I want now to introduce Lizzie, who will um, talk to us about her work uh, to engage people with sense and also more specifically about the project Odd uh, featured in the exhibition. So please, Lizzie, it's your time to shine. Hello everyone um, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you Clara and uh, to the museum and it's lovely to feel connected to the show somehow rather than just knowing that the ode is over there and then I never sadly get to come to San Francisco this time so thank you and uh, yeah I'm, I've got so many questions about alphabet so hopefully we can discuss it more in a bit. Um, thank you Peter it was really nice to listen to you. Um, I'm just going to share my screen um, and then get started. 
Okay. Oops. Okay. Lovely. So um, the way I thought I would approach this today is to build up to discussing um, what uh, we did with Ode, but to sh a bit like Peter to show how um, we got to that point through some of my earlier work um, and what it taught me about using scent in a social context. Um, so um, I just thought I would go right back to the beginning to the Odette Toilette Origins movie. Um, so my first ever uh, smell related uh, piece of work were some events called Scratch and Sniff, which started in 2010. And um, they were kind of like a social club in the evening for people to come together and sniff interesting fragrances in a way that was a lot more relaxing than you'd get in a um, department store, which is normally where we might have the chance to smell a scent or like a duty free shop. And I didn't know what I was doing and um, still don't really know what I'm doing in a lot of settings, but um, this really, um, this very sort of spontaneous and um, naive event series um, in a way had good timing because when we were bringing people together in this way, um, I think in 2010, what was happening is that the palette of materials and fragrance styles that we were able to access as consumers, as the public, was really starting to explode. So um, we might have been used to being able to smell a rose or a lavender or a citrus, but because of experimental perfumery that was really kind of building up at that time, um, Indie perfumers um, were um, seeing what they could do with the materials they could obtain from uh, the, the industrial houses. And also brands were starting to break free of um, traditional fragrance categories. So uh, one of the things that was great about these events is we got to smell weird stuff that was not, it wasn't what we were used to smelling. Um, and a lot of it, it, it might have been new ingredients, whether that's captive materials that have some kind of intellectual property around them, um, or it might have been ingredients that weren't that commercial and hadn't been smelt much before. But we also learned how, I don't know, red pepper or celery could smell a bit like gasoline if you kind of smell them in a way and you tune your brain in into that way. So, so I think everyone who came learned a lot about the interconnectedness of of smells. Um, the other thing that it taught me was just how quick you can build a community around olfaction, around people coming together to smell things. And I know you'll have found that in the uh, in the exhibition, of course, and through your live events. Um, and that strangers can come together and be very comfortable with each other in a way that I hadn't really seen with any other subjects. And that was really interesting. Um, as the events developed, I learned how to be more inclusive. So for example, lots of attendees could be really confident about saying, oh, this smell takes me here, or I'm reminded of this, blah, blah, blah. Um, but a lot of people still felt quite um, scared about speaking. And so I used to have events where people could smell um, materials or perfumes and play with clay or oil pastels or other materials. And they never had to kind of explain what they were doing or um, give any meaning behind it. But I suppose looking at kind of non-linguistic uh, ways that you could respond and move between the senses. Um, and I think interestingly, and, and maybe other panelists will disagree with me, but it almost feels like now the expansion of the palette has slowed down. So it's less frenzied than it was maybe a decade ago. Um, and it's settled a little bit. And I'm finding it harder to smell things that are genuinely like, wow, I've never encountered that before. But that what's happening now is we've got an expansion in our thinking of how smell can support us, how smell can enhance our lives, which as I'm sure Danielle will talk a lot about has really been helped. <laughs> it's like a sort of strange logic by COVID because obviously we all now, lot, most of us sort of suddenly realize, oh wow, this is what smell can do. Um, so 
from the scratch and sniff events, I wanted to dive deeper a little bit. And so I started um, with a friend of mine doing a podcast called Life in Sense, which was um, interview based. And we would just ask people to talk about the smells from their lives that meant something to them. And <clears throat> uh, we had people who make historic pigments interviewed we interviewed an astronomer and then we interviewed people who were maybe writers or uh you did all sorts of jobs and professions um or had different experiences and that was fascinating for learning how you build a narrative about scent or around the sense of smell and that there's this dance between um creating a story that is inclusive and that others feel they can recognize in themselves so for example so many people who went on it said my favorite smells sun cream or suntan lotion that was like the number one thing that we got told so that's a very kind of obviously there's cultural difference but very open and inclusive story that you can build a community around um, and on the other hand you get really specific stories and I often find with smell that managing those two spaces and make, moving between them is a really big challenge, but always fascinating. Um, and yeah, if you, I mean, we don't do that podcast anymore, but it was really, um, there are a few nice episodes and they're about 15, 20 minutes each. Um, off the back of that work, I ended up helping with some um, installations on smell and certainly not to the you know to the extent of um peter your your work but um i did support a few productions here in london and one of them was called the tate sensorium which was a way of experiencing artworks through all of your senses um and at that time i think this was seven oh, seven years ago um, <laughs> um i think terms like cross-modalism and synesthesia, multimodal design, and this idea of the sort of the way that different disciplines speak to each other and shape our perceptions was a very fertile place. Um, and so there was a lot of buzz at that time around this sort of thing, and there were lots of equivalents happening around the world. And um, one of the things that was really striking there was this question of if you're using smell in a design context, how specifically, how do you need to nail the smell? So, so a lot of this work obviously is you're designing a scent or you're commissioning a scent for a particular purpose and you can want it to be as close to your intended aroma as possible so that it's evocative and and works for your audience um but i remember with this one um it was a really good lesson in learning how the other senses um are so important for shaping what you smell and what you think of it that in some instances you don't have to have a high fidelity smell so it's almost like trying to find the perfect color for your canvas and you can't quite get the right green but sometimes that doesn't matter and you can get a green that's like not your ideal um but that when it comes to the that final moment of being seen or smelt that it it does work um and um i think in a lot of projects we found that um certainly in this one this was pollution pods by the artist michael pinsky this was an um, aromatic recreation of the smell of pollution in different cities. And, you know, coming up with the exact smell of a fume that's produced by a type of industrial plant in Sao Paulo, it's quite hard to do. Um, there is technology that gets you close, but um, because of the storytelling that went was in place before people stepped into the pods, they were really um, ready to smell to smell the pollution. And um, IFF, who um, I know Peter has worked with regularly and who provided the sense for this, they did a brilliant job of, of these evocative smells. But um, it, some people would go into the pollution pods and they, even before they stepped in, they thought they were smelling something and were so in some instances having a kind of, I don't wanna do it, like, oh, it's toxic or, 
Um, and they hadn't even they hadn't even stepped into the pods at that point. Um, so it's very powerful this interplay of smell, not just with the other senses, but of the information that you're given before you come to encounter it. Um, but um, as I've kind of had lots of discussions over the years, it can also be a kind of really difficult conversation to have with an audience, sort of how much information do you give them and how much consent do you ask for them um, when it comes to like, you're gonna come to this venue and it's gonna smell of something, is that okay? Um, and I remember, um, Peter, I don't know if you remember the Ode Europa conversations we had, the big European Union project on smell and heritage settings and in museums. There was a lot of conversation about kind of consent and um, responsible use of scent in different, different contexts. Um, a little bit of a tangent, but I think an important kind of question. Um, and then in 2017, and maybe this is where I, Clara and I first spoke perhaps, was at the Somerset House exhibition. This was a, a perfume exhibition where you, in, you discovered 10 interesting fragrances that are on the market today. So it might have been a perfume from Comte de Garçon or from Dies and Durga, so the kind of niche houses who are selling fragrance and that you can buy. And we created 10 spaces and designed um, 10 sets. So it was a real set design project in a way where you would come and smell these fragrances and you weren't told what they were when you smelled them and you, you could discover more about them later. Um, and again, this was really interesting from the point of view of access and uh, we tried to make the 10 spaces as broad as possible in terms of um, how you smelt the smell, whether it was close up or more ambient, um, what level the surface was, whether it's low or high, whether you're on your own or with other people in that particular space, is it crowded or quiet? Um, and again, that I think really helped people to feel comfortable because they knew that somewhere in that space they'd find some a, a room that was to their liking and that made them feel comfortable and, and excited rather than overwhelmed. Um, and even just having 10 smells in, uh, in the course of an hour to, to smell, that felt like quite a lot for people to kind of digest and assimilate into their brains um, and I'm constantly interested by this question of like how many smells is too many how many is enough like what can we take can can we build up our tolerance so that we can go and smell 50 things in an hour and we're fine um, it sounds like the alphabet might be a way of doing that um, uh, some of the other work that I've done over the years is editing and I just wanted to mention this book because I think it's quite a good overview of what's been happening in fragrance in the past 10 years. So this is a book that was created um, by IFRA UK and IFRA is the International Fragrance Association and IFRA UK hosts a conference every year where they invite um, chemists, psychologists, artists, anyone working in olfaction to come and share their research. And this is a digest of every single talk pretty much over those 10 years. Um, and I think what it what is interesting about it is you can see how quickly um, certain ideas in olfaction have been popularized and main, made mainstream and how much momentum is building behind this field um, in such a, a short space of time. Um, but also just how much debate, how much debate there still is about certain fundamental things like pheromones or chemo signals. And there's a particularly interesting conversation in there, there about sort of presenting psychology psychology research and how careful you have to be not to reinforce false assumptions. And I think certainly in the um in the mainstream media, there are certain narratives around how smell works that are sort of still being perpetuated that aren't necessarily true or helpful. And so I suppose when we're using scent in a social setting, we need to be thoughtful about not making 
grandiose claims that can't be backed up um, and just making sure we're not sort of propagating it's not necessarily misinformation but perhaps not quite fully um, kind of answered hypotheses um, so that leads me to ode um, I find it's interesting I, find, I haven't spoken about ode for a while and, and um, being really honest I find it quite hard because um, I was personally a bit scared about scaling ode um, and it's a project and a product where I had a lot of belief in it um, and I think that what it is seeking to do is really important but I don't think I ever felt really confident about going out and advocating for it um, and so it's almost sort of my like it's not a failure but it's one of these kind of in terms of the commercial side of it it didn't take off because I was I think I was scared to really promote it to be honest um, and so I almost think it's helpful for me to talk about how it kind of got to that point and what I learned from uh, from working on it and having it as my baby for a couple of years. Um, so Ode was designed as a product to support people living with dementia, um, which is going to affect one in three of us, I think, um, people born um, now or in the last 20 years, one in three of us will, will develop a form of dementia. And I remember researching the, um, the kind of trajectory of what happens a, a lot of the time when you do have Alzheimer's or dementia and um, that sort of later stage where you move into a residential care home or you have a lot of support can be very debilitating and there's a, obviously a loss of independence. And I wanted to see if smell could help because I'd hosted loads of workshops um, in care homes uh, where we just get people to chat about their favorite perfumes that they remembered. And the issue that kept coming up was around weight loss and that once, you're, once you get to a certain stage, you kind of lose interest in eating a lot of the time. And that once your weight starts to really plummet, it's sort of, um, big signal that you, you're nearing the end of life and that you need really intensive care. Um, and it's really difficult for um, institutions and individual carers to support people because they're just rushing around and they don't have time to go, oh, will you have a bit of this sandwich or have some soup or whatever? They're just kind of get quick medication are they comfortable you know let's make sure they're they're safe and so there seemed to be a real need for um products and services that um were very hands-off and discreet and sensitive um to someone might not want to be nagged all day long like come on eat your dinner let's go 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 um, and so Ode was a way of answering that because it, it was a, a device that was, it was mains powered and it had uh, three fragrances in it that corresponded to different times of day. And the fragrances are released in the lead up to you being served your meal. Um, and of course, ideally, you want to smell your cooking smell when you are in your hospital or wherever and think oh dinner's coming great and I'm salivating but the problem is that lots of people don't don't get those cues uh, they don't smell the food being prepared because it's happening in another part of the building so it just arrives on their laps or on their tray just out of nowhere and they don't really know like what oh okay I've got to eat this and there's just no sort of enticement that sort of seduction you have in a restaurant where you can hear the noises from the kitchen and smell that dinner's coming. So Ode was a way of substituting in that, um, that, that sensory cue. And um, funnily enough, from seeing the other exhibits in the uh, exhibition, I remember early on being really influenced by Japanese uh, incense clocks um, and this idea of telling the time through a fragrance, which I think some of the other designers have been really influenced by as well. Um, so um, 
one of the things that I think Ode really did get right was it we put a lot of effort into coming up with um, authentic food fragrances and I think one area of opportunity is there could be a lot more collaboration between fragrance the fragrance world and the flavor world and these two worlds do talk to each other but not as much as they could and it's almost as if there's a whole other world of smells that could be harnessed that come from the flavor industry but because they're not used in a commercial context for fragrances a lot of the time we don't get to kind of play with them um, and uh, and food is you know is the way that so many of us um, give meaning to our lives like food is important I would say to most people and it gives us pleasure it obviously keeps us alive um, and that's something that I thought Ode did really well is it was putting these lovely baking smells into environments that were either sterile or not necessarily the most pleasant from an olfactory point of view. Um, but some of the, the, the kind of design questions that haunt me a little bit are, we, we wanted Ode to be um, really uh, passive uh, because when we were doing our ethnographic research in care homes or in people's private homes, we were told time and time again we don't have time to fiddle with a device. It needs to run by itself. Um, and, and when I say we, I should say with Rod Design, who, who are the brilliant design agency who work with me on this. Um, but when it came to it, to bringing it out in the field, funnily enough, people love the idea of having smell sticks. They wanted this really intensive, intimate connection with smell that was up close, where they could have an object and really get stuck in and there would be some sort of interaction with a carer around it that they could have a conversation and a coming together and say oh do you like that smell I do and how does it make you feel and I think that I was so keen to kind of make things easy for everyone that I missed that that even if people told us they wanted hands off emotionally they actually really didn't and that a totally ambient smell is difficult for a lot for to get your head round because you want to see where it's coming from or you want to kind of latch onto something that you can associate with it um so we kind of went down this route of having this sort of lovely device that sort of does the job in a kind of whizzy way and uh and then from a commercial point of view, thinking, oh, they're going to be quite expensive to make. And do we tool up and get the pot, you know, go to China or wherever and get this made and spend a load of money on on the tooling? Um, could we have done it in a way that was more low key and intimate? I think we probably could have done. And um, uh, we were part of a kind of design process that had a kind of particular runway and where you had to kind of show a show your device and your model and, and I think we kind of we created something lovely but that could have sort of potentially gone down a different route and I'd love to hear from other designers I'm sure this happens a lot and um, I know I'm not the only one um, and the other thing that I, I experienced with Ode is that when you come in and you're thinking about using smell in a practical way, there are all sorts of obstacles, as there are with any design intervention. Um, and I think I wanted to kind of make everything better, like, oh, if we could just sort of sort out that problem as well and bring in the smell, then it would work so much better. Or, oh, there's a malodor control in this care home can we sort out that or um we've got badly like people can't see their cutlery or to, to eat their food anyway so what good is a smell to make you want your food if the, if you can't eat your food or you don't you know you don't have a way of um chewing it if you've got uh, swallowing difficulties and i think that um yeah, I went into kind of Mary Poppins land and thought I want to make everything better rather than accepting the limits of what, you know, what a smell can do um, and that a smell can't be a kind of magic plaster for everything. Um, 
I'm sure there's a lot more that um, I could say, but I'll, I'll stop there and maybe we can pick some up in the conversation. But I sort of, I don't want to leave it on a downbeat place, which I wanted to say that Ode, I think um, it was, it was a real delight to work on. And I hope that others do explore this um, avenue. I sure, I think they are. And um, that the pleasure of seeing someone start to eat again when they hadn't, and it's all because they had this smell sort of given to them a few times a day really was quite special so yeah thank you so much and uh hope that was useful and looking forward to the discussion thank you lizzie and guess it was very useful <laughs> um and finally uh to make sure we don't perpetuate false assumptions uh about smells uh i'll turn to danielle and her presentation about how we smell why we smell and the possible causes consequences of being deprived of this sense and uh whatever you want to talk about danielle so you're yes up. so thank you i'll be uh with you here just as soon as i get my share screen going So yes, so I've got two things for you today. So I brought you two things. So one thing I, I hope to bring you is my perspective as a scientist and an expert in the sense of human smell. But I also come to you um, as, a, as a learner in that I managed to go through the exhibit and to glean what I could, you know, sort of with, through the lens of science, but what did I learn as I experienced this um, exhibit. So that was really fascinating for me too. So we have two things that I'm bringing to you today. So um, the first thing I think to make the point is, is that um, smell is essentially an emotional sense. So here we have a man enjoying the beautiful, wonderful smell of the cup of coffee in the morning. And then we have this alternative universe where the coffee is no longer beautiful and is a sense very off-putting. So we have these two views. And this is not really an alternative universe where coffee smells badly for, that this actually is a, 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 the reality for many people. So one of the things I wanted to bring to you from a scientific perspective is to put the sort of facts at your disposal about what has happened to the human sense of smell during COVID-19. So in the early days of the pandemic, up to 85% of people who were infected with the early variants lost their sense, lose their sense of smell. And um, this is less the case with Delta and Omicron, mercifully. And what happens is not only that people lose their sense of smell temporarily, that we would say scientifically they become anosmic, they can't smell anything. But what happens is some people persist in their inability to smell even after their other symptoms resolve. And not only that, but what happens for many is that they actually get worse in the sense that they develop these distortions in their sense of smell. And one of the most common distortions that people report is that coffee smell becomes almost fecal and unpleasant like poop. And people also report that there's a phantosmia. So a parosmia is a distortion in smell. A phantosmia is you smell something that's not really there. And people report something they call chemical smell or COVID smell, sort of this persistent um, chemical very unpleasant smell that accompanies them wherever they go. So regardless of, of uh, whether people have parosmia or phantosmia or anosmia, the sense of smell is affected in about 10 to 20 percent of people after their other symptoms have fully resolved. So this leaves us with literally millions of people worldwide who are living in a different smell universe than they were we were two years ago. So I also wanted to bring to you sort of the facts in the biology of smell. So there are five, essentially, there are essentially five steps in our sense of smell. One is the chemical structure of the molecules that are volatilized in the environment. So you sniff, you literally sniff chemicals up your nose and these chemicals physically touch the olfactory receptors. Now, the olfactory receptors, for those of you who are watching the, the screen, um, 
uh, I'm pointing to my nose here. So right between where your glasses sit on your nose, if you just pushed right back straight there, that, um, if that's the roof of the nose. So up the nose to the very roof, that's where the olfactory receptors reside. So they're really right at the interface at the roof of the nose, but not yet to the brain. And so the smell occurs because the neurons that live in the, the roof of the nose project into the brain through something called the cribriform plate. Now I mentioned the cribriform plate because it's a hard bony structure. And so the nerves of smell are very soft and delicate. And so when people jar their heads, that sharp bone sometimes shears those soft, delicate nerves. And that's one of the other causes of olfactory loss. And so one of the things we do, at least in the United States, is we monitor football players, for instance, for smell loss to get a sense of how much head trauma that they have. And of course, once the neurons go from the nose and they talk to the brain, then the brain interprets what it's understood. And we call that scent or our experience of smell. Now there are 400 or plus olfactory receptors. So the different ways that smells can be coded by at the level of the receptor. And that's, there are obviously billions of smells and those are all coded through a combination of receptors. So if you think a little bit about going to a piano and playing a chord on a piano, there are many different ways you can create a chord on a piano that conveys a slightly different um, auditory experience. And it's the same with smell. So the receptors form patterns that the brain can understand. So that, uh, that's the part where I'm a scientist coming to you as an expert. I just told you about um, the devastation that COVID has wrought on the sense of smell. We've talked a little bit about the effects of the different variants on the sense of smell. We reviewed anosmia, phantosmia, and parosmia. And I also just told you how the sense of smell occurs at a mechanistic level. So we sort of took it from, from the, the, the molecules up the nose into the brain and the decoding. So here I became, I, I sort of left my expert hat at the door and I became a learner. And so I really had the very great privilege of at least uh, virtually walking through um, the exhibit, um, Life with Sense. And I asked from a scientific perspective, what is there here that I can learn? And of course, uh, one of the things that's an occupational hazard of dealing with scientists, if whenever given a problem, we immediately like to count things. And so I counted the number of exhibits, I counted 37, and I counted the words used to describe the things in, in the exhibit. And then I tried to extract meaning about what each exhibit, each of the, each of the items said um, to us as sensory scientists. And I learned a couple of very things I did not expect. So I attributed, I gave each um, of the individual exhibits um, sort of a, a main focus. And I was very surprised that almost a quarter of the, of the exhibits, I'm a little nervous that I'm using the word exhibit wrong, but the, perhaps the, the artists and curators will, will correct me if that's not the correct terminology. But the main point was is that 25% had to do with health and well, trying to improve health. So we just, of course, had a beautiful um, conversation with Lizzie about the efforts to improve appetite, um, people that have dementia. We also heard a, a really beautiful description from Peter about trying to improve the experience of people that are um, visually impaired. So comes as no surprise probably to you, but to me, I was really fascinated that there was a real drive for this. The idea that we're after beauty and uh, that, that there's a just a sort of a tacit, uh, tacit uh, appreciation aesthetic of scent, of course, surprises no one. And the other thing that surprised me is, is that um, we are really focused, there was some focus on the contemplation of scent, so a way to focus the mind hard on the particular odor in front of us. So that was a theme with some. Storytelling and memory, of course, um, one of the if people that don't think much about smell will often really resonate to the idea that it, that a smell can take you immediately back to where you were when, right? So those connections, I think, are really easy to understand. And the other thing I thought was interesting was is that the the power of smell to merely change emotion 
So it was actually not a very common theme of these, which, you know, in some senses, I would think would be perhaps the most common thing as an art we're, mo we're moved to experience. And uh, this was not a very common theme. So I thought that was quite interesting. Um, the other thing I thought was really fascinating is I asked the question about agency. So what do I mean when I say agency? So in when people are interacting with these objects, sort of are, is the person um, interacting with an object in the way that they control? So I pick something up, I smell it, I set it down, I walk away. Or is the scent somehow pervasive in the environment? Um, we had a really beautiful um, and very helpful um, exegesis of this point when Lizzie was talking about consent. Can we really, um, what can we do to people who are coming to view our art or your art? And what happens when we make people cry as Peter so movingly described when dealing with the refugee project? So scent and agency. And so when I looked at the exhibits um, in the current um, in, in Living with Scents, I found that about a quarter of the exhibits had to do with ambient odor, releasing odor for others, whether others consented or not, frankly. So making the air more beautiful or, or bringing on some desirable quality. And then in some cases, the, um, the agency was with the user. I am going to do something. I'm going to smell something now, and I can put it away. And there was a sort of sense of generalness. So I'm going to wear perfume, and that's going to be a more generalized thing. But then we also had about 25% of agency that was very specific. And I would classify Lizzie and Peter's projects in that sense of like, I am using odor. I, I'm choosing to use an odor in a specific way. So I will enhance appetite. I will use it to communicate and so forth. So I thought that was a very interesting sort of mix of what we were talking about in terms of agency. And I'll leave you with this point. So the other thing that I told you in the beginning, we saw the picture of the man sniffing coffee and, and sometimes it's good, but for people with parosmia, it's not good. We heard earlier about the refugees sniffing blood and the unpleasant experience, people sniffing pollution and unpleasant experience. So we really have a strong sense that unpleasant odors can change human emotion in a way that can be a very powerful tool in art. But it's a weapon that people are, not a weapon, wrong choice of words, but it's a tool that people are using, um, I found, very sparingly. And when I classified the, each exhibit for the valence, the hedonics, the emotional sort of temperature, if you will, I found that the majority of exhibits were really geared toward pleasant odors or trying to, um, to, to stay on that side of the, the hedonic experience. And odors that were pleasant or scary or might be fearful, human hair, for instance, the burning of human hair, these were very sparingly used. So this is just an observation that I've made as a scientist. So I also just will end by saying that um, I am obviously a scientist, but there was a very small part of me that asked the question of, of what, what struck me as the most powerful motif um, pulling together all of the exhibits, which I, I hope you'll all get a chance to experience because it was really very interesting. And I came away from that thinking a lot about masks. Masks was a theme and a topic in the, uh, the, some of the exhibits. And I was thinking about the concentration of odorant. And one of the things that masks have done for us is they really concentrate our breath and the things that are going on in our air supply. And wouldn't it be interesting to take those masks and distill those essential features for individual people and play those back for us in 10 or 20 years time to really catapult us back to a very unique part in human history. So that is um, the journey of a scientist uh, through taste and uh, through smell and sort of my uh, fledgling thinking about um, art as the, through the lens of science. And that is the material that I have for you today. So I'm happy to turn it back over to Clara and to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Danielle, and I love your analysis.
to the exhibition because it's so thorough and interesting for us curators to have this kind of statistical feedback that we actually did not expect, but shows a great understanding of the topic and help or also helps us understand what we've done and um, what we've put together. Um, one comment though, I'm not sure in 10 or 20 years, I'd love to actually re-smell what I smell every day in the Paris uh, subway in my mask, but maybe if you live in a nicer setting, it will be a, a nice memory, but probably not for me. And just before, um, I maybe, I don't know if we already have questions or if we have any questions from the audience, I just wanted to uh, shortly um, conclude or sum up what we've seen, because I think what we've heard today uh, and the main thing we can retain from all of what we heard is how useful actually our not long neglected sense of smell actually is. Um, living without it is certainly a challenge. Um, I've tried it at the beginning of COVID, like um, Daniel mentioned, many, many other people. Um, we've also learned how deepening our connection to it can actually ease lives. And I think that's why the work of designers is so important to create adequate and relevant mediums to deliver, interact with and use smells to push people to go from passive smelling, um, an act that just goes along breathing in and out to active deliberate smelling. And this can be, through, be done through objects, devices, exhibitions, um, scenography events, and even podcasts and writing as we've um, seen. And one of the things I wanted to ask uh, Lidzi and Peter, who have uh, curated many events and situations in which visitors had to use their sense of smell in a more meaningful um, and quite sometimes quite unusual way beyond what we associate with beauty uh, or uh, cosmetics or a purely hedonic experience. Um, I was wondering when you brought in the context of olfactory encounters and the applications for smells, what kind of public reactions have you witnessed? How do people um, or do not maybe modify their behavior when they start to pay real attention to smell? Um, I don't know, uh, Lizzie, Lizzie will, uh, do you want to go first or? Yeah, sure. So um, I, yeah, I've probably done a few hundred events now and um, everyone is different and the kind of vibe of the crowd or the gathering can really shape then how, pe how willing people are to smell in a way that is more deliberate or thoughtful. Um, it's, I, I guess it comes down to this question of kind of concentrating and what it feels like to concentrate on a smell, because we kind of know what it feels like when we're really concentrating on a piece of music as opposed to just hearing it in the background. And the same when we're really looking at something and examining it. Um, and when we're looking at a piece of visual art, we are, we might zoom in on color or brush stroke or metaphor or you know there's so many ways we can concentrate but when we're smelling there's also loads of different ways you can concentrate right there's like what am I smelling and there's what does it remind me of and then there are what's how do I feel when I smell this but there are other ways you can concentrate as well that maybe we haven't even sort of necessarily defined yet and I um I only just really thought of that but Probably over the events, I've, I've seen so many people go from being quite hostile and defensive about smell as if it was an embarrassment or not some, this isn't what I'm into. Often it's, it's been men who think this is a women's thing and um, they're, they're dragged along by their girlfriends and they are my favorite people <laughs> to come to an event because by the end they're like, that was good, yeah. Yeah, I see what you're doing here. But actually I watch them and you just see them kind of slow down and body language change and just kind of, oh, yes. And there's a sort of releasing that happens in their bodies, I think. So it's interesting. There's a kind of relaxing into smell 
and letting it just be and not worrying about whether you can do it but there's also an a focusing as well and different kinds of focusing yeah i also have to say it's it's, it's really a lot of to do with uh, emotions in general uh, but i see uh, there's something changing since let's say more than 20 years ago when people experience an, uh, a fragrance a smell in an exhibition they were always wondering what is that smell they want to guess what it is these days, they are more looking, why is this smell used? And that's another way of yeah, looking to the work of art. It means that they are more standing open for the use of the sense of smell uh, in, in uh, the visual arts. Um, I must say, I, I've seen so many beautiful reactions on, on uh, uh, fragrances and ugly reactions, but, but just to mention the most beautiful I once saw, it's, it's in one way, it's not so a beautiful one, but it, it makes it beautiful because it's for this person, it, it was a, a woman, a woman that uh, visited an exhibition I did in uh, Waronne in Belgium. It was an exhibition about uh, unwilling using, uh, uh, losing your identity. Uh, so it went about uh, survivors from Auschwitz that I interviewed, and um, uh, also uh, people who got uh, chemotherapy and also lost their hair. Um, and it, on the opening, I let, let my hair cut by my parents. And, uh, but on the opening, there was one woman coming to me and she was crying and, uh, and, and she, she looked so angry at them. And then, then she started to thank me, like, like this is so beautiful. You're, you make it so aware to people, the idea from uh, uh, chemotherapy, uh, how, how it's hurting people, but what, what it does with someone. And I think that was one of the most beautiful moments I, I, I think this is why I'm an artist, why I'm doing this, this work, for having these kinds of reactions, someone that uh, feels that, uh, that, that, that this has a meaning, you know, that, uh, uh, that, that, that feels that they are appreciated and that you uh, have, have a, a vision, uh, I would say, uh, that you uh, stand for them, that you want to, to show it to the world because they don't get attention and and with the smell, you can break the boundaries in one way. It's it's always emotional, I think. Yeah. I don't know. The, yeah, no, it's great. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. Uh, I, I wanted to something Lydia said uh, re reminded me of something I said in a, in another lecture recently about how we don't we have a word to say I look and I observe we can hear and we can listen but we smell and smell and there's no words to kind of describe this sustained attention that we have for vision or for hearing mm -hmm. and maybe in the future uh we'll come up with a with a word in at least in western languages because probably they have words like this in other culture but not in english and not in french at least not for now um i also wanted to ask um all my questions are all kind of like very uh, wide in general, but using, I, I thought you, about using scent as a way to share information from human to human, either to read with your nose or to communicate with body others or to prompt a behavior such as um, stimulate uh, appetite and push people to eat. Interesting because it builds on mammals' uh, natural abilities to communicate with others. Um, but it completely culturalized this ability by creating a deliberate language or a deliberate set of signs with uh, specific, specifically, sorry, specifically chosen molecules. And um, I was wondering, um, and this is a wide question for Peter, Daniel, or Lizzy, based on your respective research, um, how do we tailor sense uh, to communicate with each other. Um, first part of my question might be more for Peter and Daniel. For example, is it really possible and easy to learn to read from the tip of your nose? And the other question, the other part of my question would be for Lizzie. How do you culturally ta um, yeah, tailor a scent to appeal to certain demographics like you did uh, with the odd and the smell of British food? Um, sorry, very long question. Um, I guess the first part would be really uh, how do we learn to read and is it as easy to 
read from your nose as it is to read from the tip of your fingers or from um, just uh, words and, and reading, sorry. I'll, I'll hop in here and just say context is everything. So you use the you use the correct word when you said learn. And so when we go pick up the date and the date is covered with cologne, it doesn't matter what the cologne smells like. It's the context that tells you is the communication. So you can pair those two things. And so it's really about learning. There's very little that comes to us sort of we're born understanding the, the language of smell a lot. It's learn. It's really learning in context. I, I agree totally. Context is very important. It's, uh, um, it makes a work of art uh, understandable also uh, related to the, the fragrance. Um, related to telling about uh, the top of your, if, if it's difficult, more difficult with your fingers to read than with your nose, I think it's easier to read with your eyes because they're closer to your brains and then to your nose. It's easier to read and then with your fingers because they're farther away, I think. Wow. That would be the, a normal way of uh, a very uh, childish way of thinking, I think. Uh, but but of course, uh, uh, it, it goes all about uh, the will to do and uh, taking time and effort uh, to, to do it. About culture, I have to say, when you make work and some fragrances, uh, just to give an example, the smell of baby powder smelled different in Switzerland and in Belgium. And they invited me for an exhibition uh, to, to install a work, uh, uh, Soft World. It, it's totally space covered out uh, with, with cotton, with one meter cotton, you have to go inside. And, uh, and there's the smell of baby powder. But when the curator came to visit my studio and she smelled baby powder, she said, no, that's not baby powder. So um, she sent me then the baby powder from uh, Switzerland. And uh, yeah, it was totally different. So it, there are differences. But I think there, there, you still can use in scents there are a lot of common sense through cultures. And there's recently a, a research that uh, uh, the scent of uh, um, uh, vanilla, uh, everyone loved that. So, so that, that, that's one of the most positive fragrances. But also there are the warnings fragrances that's very useful to use to, to communicate over the boundaries of cultures that that's, uh, makes people aware of things like the smell of, of sweat, the smell of uh, um, fire, smell of smoke, smell of air pollution, things that they, they all experience everywhere. So um, when you combine these things, you, you can make, yeah, you can work, yeah, you can make work that's, that's understandable for different cultures, I think. I, I, I just wanted to ask you something specific about what you just said. You mentioned how smells can be pleasant or unpleasant, um, sometimes universally, most of the times not. And so what happens if when in the alphabet, one of the letter has a smell that's very unpleasant to one of the readers, wouldn't that compromise uh, the engagement of, the, of this person with this way of reading? It, it's something that would never happen with actual letters because you can't say, you, you, you'll never hear, I hate the W or, um, the letter M is really unpleasant to me. It's not something that can happen, but with smells, it, it actually can. H how do you navigate with this kind of problem? Yeah, in, in writing, it does it happen also. People who have um, uh, problems with reading, there are a lot of people uh, who, who, who cannot read good in one way. So there, it, it's, it's not, not so we always think everyone can read good. But there are people who have, have difficulties with, for, for example, dyslexia or something. It's, and so it's, it's also difficult to read. There are special letter types designed for it that they can read it also. And uh, so, so it's, but with the bad scent, of course, you have it. And that's, that's why there has to be done research, a lot of research. When you, even when you put two letters next to or two fragments next to it, that you can, that you can smell, okay, all right, this is aldehyde, say 18, and this is uh, cis. Uh, um, uh, cis three hexanol, or you, you have to, you, you have to, yeah, you, you have to have the possibility to read it. And of course, there can be a, a not a not so a good scent in it. But I think that's also interesting to use, for example, for a question mark or a point or something. <laughs> to say here, yeah, it goes, or to start with a uh, capital letter, like in, uh, in Braille, they also put a separate um sign uh, uh, points in before the letter to say now it's a capital or now it's a it's a, it's a um, 
um, this this kind of uh, letter or something. So it's 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 uh, yeah it's it's fine it's 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 yeah I think it's 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 not uh, easy. It's it's uh, there is still to do uh, a lot of research for that. Yeah, definitely. And in Lidzi, uh, when you worked uh, on odds, you had to take into account the cultural differences in smell appreciation, which I guess was also one of the difficulty in the creative brief that to you had to nail this particular scent um, that was uh, for this particular kind of like people or demographic. Yeah, totally. And we found there were, um, well, it's really interesting because in terms of when you look at appetite stimulation, there's the associative kind of power of a smell to make us think of food. And then there are smells that can prompt uh, a response in the body. So one of the things that we found out is that smelling citruses um, can trigger salivation. So, um, and, and salivating is a way that our body obviously prepares to ingest food. So I, I believe that the smell of citrus is a pretty universal response. But on the other hand, um, yeah, we were working in, in a British European context and we were looking at uh, people who are generally aged 80 plus. And um, I'm happy to say British foods got a lot more diverse in recent years years but the kind of constituents for the ode grew up on hearty British food like pies and pastries and um, kind of that in its food that's not as kind of um, got those kind of volatile aromatics that you might associate with um, other international cuisines so it was really interesting how we wanted to try and convey the idea of sugar and fat through the smell and how to do the smell of this, a smell that evokes fat in a way that doesn't isn't kind of off-putting and so we did land on um, our menu but we obviously then when we were looking at international expansion we were getting contact from Japan a lot because Japan has an aging population and invests a lot in um, Alzheimer's care and like we don't, we're not going to be any good at um, coming up with authentic Japanese smells. And it was a question of again going back to what I said earlier about high fidelity versus using the other senses to do the work for you. So, do you design something that really speaks to a particular culture, or do you go with vanilla and you? You tell the story around vanilla in different ways. Or sorry, for different markets. Um, so it's a really, it's a really interesting one. And, um, you know, again, as Peter says, I think they need they're, more work has to happen on that to, um, kind of get us there. What, what it raises also is the question about the commercial side. You mentioned that, uh, um, the commercial dimension of Oud was, uh, not a complete success and, it's not uncommon that with this kind of project, the commercial dimension, the commercial side can be a challenge to say the least. So how do you and, and Peter also think this is some, how do you think we can remedy in the future or how can we um, work with, um, I don't know, um, companies and, and, and the publics and maybe schools to actually make it easier in the future for these devices and these kind of projects to actually uh, be on shelves and be accessible um, for the people. Yeah, well, one of the difficulties is around intellectual property in scent. So not only obviously is it difficult to IP a fragrance itself, like it has been done, but it would cost a lot of money. Um, but when it comes to technology, a lot of patents have already been filed around, um, you know, mechanisms by which you distribute a fragrance. So that might be Johnson and Johnson or, you know, big, big um, multinational corporations. And so I think that um, what's been fashionable in design in general in the last 15 years, I guess, is joint ventures and incubation programs where you bring together the startup with a huge organization who can 
quickly set up a supply chain or manage that. Um, and I remember we had conversations around that with Oge and a couple were, were interested, but it was, we, it was very difficult for us to meet in the middle um, and find a way of sort of developing that and, and pursuing it. And in other products, it's been very successful in say food and beverage industries where Diageo will support a small startup food business, for example. In fragrance, I think it is more difficult. I don't think I have the answer and maybe I'm not the most well informed about where it has happened successfully. I'd be interested to know, to know if it has. I, I think, uh, I think it, it takes time uh, to, 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 to see where it will go to, but I think if you want to change something, it should start all with education in general. And uh, it should start when they are little, little children should learn in school to smell. It should be part of the education that uh, they can smell. This is healthy, this is not healthy. This is uh, it's just little things also with food. Um, that they learn that uh, eating a hamburger every day is not healthy, uh, that, that they should take care of their, their, the, the things that they eat, and, uh, and the importance of smelling, that they start to learn it in school. And then in 10, 20 years, there will be, it will be totally integrated. And I think it maybe in, in 100 years, it will be at the same level of uh, the vision, at, uh, visual. Um, but I can be wrong, of course. <laughs> Um, Charlotte, do we have time? Can I ask one more question? Yes, or, go for it. <laughs> and do we have question from the audience or not really? No. no. Okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask Danielle because she talked about uh, she talked about her fantasy designs and both were kind of in between. Danielle actually, uh, Danielle had to leave right uh, at the bottom of the hour, unfortunately. Oh, I can see that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, I had Another question for um, Peter and Lizzie um, that I, I was about to skip, but so I'll ask this one um, about Ode on the one side and uh, Peter's smell of flowers that was uh, set up in the center for elderly care on the other, because both projects use smell to help um, people remember where they are, what time it is that they have to eat, they stimulate their memories. Um, but I've also read that some studies have suggested that um, people suffering from neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's or dementia um, also can suffer from um, the loss of their smelling abilities. Is it something that you had to deal with or that you researched uh, or considered when you were uh, creating these projects? In 99, so when I made the smell of flowers, um, there was no research about that yet. So, so uh, when I, uh, uh, I when I conceptualized the, the the smell of flowers in 2004, it was possible to to install it in the location, um, and then uh, we, I, I let it over to aroma specialist because I found that they have someone who's close to the to the uh, people who are the meant. Uh, that they can work the, on the best way with them, and it's 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 like that. It's a problem that that uh, there are a lot of them. It, it's it's one part of losing the sense of smell when you get uh, demands. So it's it's uh, something to deal with. But the other side is is that uh, it can throw you back to your yacht and and make you also comfortable. So that's that's also I think a very positive effect. In it. Mm -hmm. But maybe when we learn to smell more, since we're li from little. Uh, starting came from when we are little, then maybe people will, yeah, there will be maybe less uh, demand people over time. Who knows? Uh, just uh, by practice. I don't know. <laughs> um, I guess all I have to add on that is um, yes, when we were developing Ode, lots of people said, why bother when you lose your sense of smell with dementia? And um, yes, it is, it is a very common. Um, almost sort of a uh, clue that someone might be um, experiencing dementia or will be. Um, but again, going back to my point that one in three people will develop dementia, which is an awful lot of people, not like that's such a huge, <laughs> that's millions and millions of people. I mean, that's billions of people, arguably, if you're going to reach later life and therefore not everyone will. And there's enough people who 
won't experience a significant enough decline in smell that it's still useful to explore it and and of course so much um research in anosmia and you know danielle would be much more expert on this but is around smell training um and again sort of slowing down cognitive um, decline if you can keep your sense of smell working at a certain level so yes I think we need to be thoughtful about that and we did think about this kind of um, uh, diffusion of the aromas and and choosing things that were quite sort of substantive and diffusive so that it would mitigate any loss of smell but it didn't kind of put us off doing it in the first place. I yeah, and I, I think both of you have a point when you say, Peter, that if we learn to smell, and uh, Lizzie, when you mentioned smell training, even at a um, more advanced age, the idea is that the more you smell, the more you can smell because you recreate your uh, new, I don't know if it's neurons or your neural connections, but by stimulating this part of your brain, you actually develop it. So it's also, I guess, a way to. Um, explore and something to keep in mind for future projects or future collaborations um, with between designers and scientists and uh, medical professionals um, and Peter you wanted to say something yeah I want something to add about the uh, smell of flowers the power in that work was actually that the uh, the, the the men people find their way back in the location where they are living so there are three um, uh, habits, uh, uh, locations uh, um, where they are separated, sleeping, and there was one central, and uh, through the smell, they find their easier their way back in the evening when they had to go back to their location where they, so in one way, it, it works, so probably unconscious, there is some power still lying in this using of smell for, for the men people, but it's, uh, there has to be uh, done more research. I know the University of Oxford uh, does a lot of research about that too about the uh, use of scent uh, uh, for, for the men people. So, uh, um, but I also want to say to uh, uh, Lizzie, your, your art is a fantastic, but really fantastic uh, work of art, I would say, because it's, it's more than work of art. I think it should be in every elderly uh, 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 location because it's, it makes people, yeah, more worth living, you know, like, uh, and, and that's, that's, that's so important. And don't think it's, it's, it's not a success. It's a great success, but it's not, it's not your fault. It's the fault from the society and they have to change. So, so, and it will come, you will see. That's a. Uh... And I think what's nice is with what we all talked about, we have the different dimensions in which smell can be useful. You have something that relates to the body, something that relates to space, something that relates to time, and something that relates to communication. And with all the project we discussed, we kind of like peeked into these four um, very important dimensions and, and, and areas in which smells can actually not be, be useful. I mean, not to say smells are omnipotent and we can do anything with them, but they actually can have impact and be used in these different uh, realms. And, I think I'll have to stop on this, um, but I wanted to thank you all so much, uh, all of you, uh, all the speakers, Lindsay, Peter, and Danielle, um, even if she had to leave. I wanted to thank uh, the Museum uh, of, uh, of Craft and Design. I wanted to thank Charlotte and Ariel and Elizabeth for all, and all the people involved in the exhibition and for making both the exhibition and this event possible, um, especially since we're all so far away from each other, it was kind of um, amazing to be able to be together even from that for this hour and a half. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, thank Clara. Um, and thank you to all of the panelists. Um, we really, really appreciate you all being here. Um, and and to all of our participants as well. Um, it's It's been really great to be able to have this conversation and sort of think beyond just vis visual art um, and, uh, and the intersection between visual and uh, olfactory art. So um, please come to the museum, check it out. Uh, if you can't come physically, then definitely uh, follow our link for the 360 view exhibition. It is so worth it. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful holiday weekend, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.